Some of you are sitting in here right now still struggling in the same sin for 15, 20 years, but you're still here. Why? Because you know this one thing. If I continue to feed my spirit, the word of God in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. If I put God in my spirit, my sin gotta go. of Luke chapter 2 and verse 7. And I want to take my time today. I'm going to try not to preach. Uh, I, want to, I want to open our eyes to see something that I think sometimes we get into the Christmas spirit and we get into the celebration of the holiday for those who uh, try to be politically correct. I, I'm not one of those people. Uh, I celebrate Christmas. Um, and it says, it says this in Luke chapter 2 and verse 7. This is where our text will come from for the day. Uh, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I'll say this, and I want to start out this way. History has given us great men who were kings. We had David and you had Solomon. You had great men who rose to a place of kingship. But kings, understand this, are men or were men who ruled regions and groups of people. Kings were men who built kingdoms to honor their own legacies. Kings were men who failed due to the limitation of their own human nature. But I want to flip the script because God gave us his son who is and was the king of kings. So if kings rule regions, if kings build, built kingdoms to their own legacies, Jesus is the king of kings. And Jesus, the king, he continues to reign and his kingdom will last forever. Jesus is the king who chose 12 ordinary men to establish his kingdom by sharing the great news that all those who believe in the legacy of his name shall inherit this kingdom. Jesus is the king who knew no sin and he sacrificed his, his life in exchange to redeem you and I back to our rightful place in his kingdom. For the time that is ours to share, I want to speak from the topic birth of the king. Three things I want to give you, three things I want to share with you today uh, from our text. And we'll move from here and go to Matthew chapter two. So you can go ahead and put your finger on that. Matthew, uh, Luke chapter two and verse seven, it says, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Sometimes the meaning of the story doesn't make sense while the story's going on. You have to get to the end to understand what really happened in the story. If you're like me, uh, some, well, some of y'all can read and read and read, uh, but I'm the type of person, I have to read, stop, comprehend, go back, read again, and, and I'm not slow, I just, I learn different. Now, some people in the room, I will not name my wife's name, but some people can read, be down here, Remember what they read and continue reading aloud as they're reading. Down. I don't know how she does that, but she skims through the book and reads everything. Some people just have a comprehension of what's going on and some people have to see it at the end. Sometimes we pay more attention to the things that mean very little and overlook the obvious things in the story. Who would have thought that God would have allowed him himself to he, he would open the door that the one who would redeem us all would come as a baby who who would have thought like that except God many were looking for Christ to come on a horse and 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 come with a, an army behind him many were looking for him to come in in shining robes and 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 and, and draped as a warrior but Christ came as an insuspecting little baby and I want to share this story, and I know if we all know the story, but I want to show you some things in the text. Not only did God present him as a baby, but he put him in one of the lowliest situations. 
we pay attention a lot, to, a lot of times to location. We pay attention to status. We pay attention to resources. But I want to I wanna show you what you missed or what we could see if we look at these things just a little deeper. I question these things. When I look at location, I say, was the stable the only option? Understand this, that Mary comes from the Davidic line. Understand that Joseph comes from a kingly line as well. So needless to say, they could have stayed with somebody. They went to the town of their birth, and if you're from out of town and you go back home, don't you always have a place to stay? So I question, how could Mary and Joseph go back to the place that they belong and there be no place for them to lay their head? But I have to, I have to continue further because when I look at it, I have to ask, were Mary and Joseph poor? Quite possibly they couldn't if be poor if they could afford an inn as they were going back to pay taxes. Let's do the math. There was money involved at some point. Maybe not a lot, maybe not a little, but enough that they can go back, travel, pay taxes, and look for a place to stay while they're there. Why was Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes? Well, that's obvious. If you ever had a baby or seen a baby, they just feel comfortable wrapped tight. That's all that is. It wasn't that they was broke and they found some shreds of string to wrap around. No, he was, that's how babies feel comfortable. So I answered that question. But I asked all these questions, and I forgot to ask the most obvious question. What was God's purpose for presenting his son to the world in this manner? And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. And I have to pause right there because that says it all. He, they laid him in a manger. A manger is a mechanism used for feeding animals. Now, I'm not calling you and I an, or an animal, but I will say this. In our sin nature, we are animal-like. And isn't it ironic that God would present his son, the savior, the deliverer of the world. And instead of placing him with family and friends, because when we look at it, there was no room for families. There was no room in the end. There was room in a lowly little manger. And what we have is our first point, which is a symbolic presentation. A symbolic presentation that God sent his son not to be a king in the way that people see king, but to take the world by feeding them himself. Later on, we come to know Jesus as the bread of life. He says to his disciples in the upper room, this is my body, which will be broken for you. And, and it wasn't in the, in the upper room. It wasn't in those moments where he tried to be deep. It had always been. From the time he was born, they put him in a place and symbolically presented him as the bread of life that one day man would take notice that this is what I feast on. I've gone days without food. I've gone moments without an appetite. But when it came to Christ, I longed for him. I desire him. And, 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 and you, you may not understand what that desire looks like. So I'll paint this picture for you. Have you ever been in sin and still can't stay away from the church? Some of you are sitting in here right now still struggling in the same sin for 15, 20 years, but you're still here. Why? Because you know this one thing. If I continue to feed my spirit, the word of God in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. If I put God in my spirit, my sin got to go. Amen. Said I wasn't going to preach. But Isaiah 15, uh, Isaiah 53 says this. Who hath believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground, for he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, 
There is no beauty that we should desire him. When God sent his son, he did not send the king in a king-like manner. He sent him in a place where people would overlook him. Matter of fact, we read later on that Herod said, all of the babies, we're going to kill all of them because we don't know who this person is. When understanding the birth of the king, first you have a symbolic presentation. Secondly, you need a wise search. You need to be on a wise search. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 verse 1 and 2. It says, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. I've heard it said wise men still seek him. I hope to be wise. I hope that I desire to seek him in my life more than I do to seek fame, fortune, and all of the things that come with that. I hope I desire to seek after the wisdom of Christ and his presence in my life more than I desire things. But I have to ask the question, who, who are these wise men? Why were they wise enough to seek Christ? The term magi is plural from the Greek word magos. It's usually translated wise men, astrologers, or magicians. We get magic from magi. Did you know that? Uh, the East, according to Genesis 25 and 6, has been variously identified as any country from Arabia to Media, where we get the Medes and the Persians, and Persia. The priest sages uh, who were extremely educated in their day were specialists in a variety of things, also known as medicine, religion, astronomy, astrology, and uh, divination and magic. Now, I thought, because I'm real smart, and I pride myself on being real smart, that astronomy and astrology were the same thing. When you research, astronomy is the study of things that enter the atmosphere, and astrology is the study of things outside of the atmosphere. Now, I have to ask this question, and I had to go into this direction because these wise men came because the astronomy side of their education has now been triggered because they said to Herod, we've seen his star in the east. Understand this. If you understand astrology, you understand that stars don't move. We say shooting stars, no such things. They have been in place, they die off, but they don't come into the atmosphere. Astronomy studies things that enter into the atmosphere. When we see what we call a shooting star, it is actually debris from outer space entering into our atmosphere and burning off. You ain't crazy, you've seen them before, right? In Matthew, uh, these wise men were in anticipation of the fulfillment of the best known prophecy in Scripture. Matthew chapter, 20, chapter 1, verse 23 says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Matthew references or cites this scripture based on the prophecy given 700 years before by Isaiah. Isaiah 7 and 4, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Do you understand that throughout the entire Bible, Jesus was always being foreshadowed. He was always being prophesied. He was, he was always the focal point. The Magi requested of the king, where is he born king of the Jews? In order to get to the question, you got to start with the wise search. When you get to a wise search, this is how you have to finish with a fulfilling find. 
Matthew chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with great joy. Now, we sang that song when we was in King Glory. You know, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with great joy. When they, right? But can I give you a little history as to why they rejoiced? This is what I never knew. Been in church all my life. Heard this Christmas story all my life. Never knew. So I'm learning. You're learning. We're learning together. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy of all of the learning in the world. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that supersedes the knowledge of Christ. Whatever sort of wise men, they were smart when it came to medicine, religion, astronomy, uh, astrology, divination, which means allowing spirits to enter and use your body. That's what happened with, with, with the story with, with, with uh, Peter, was it Peter, and, and the woman of divination. It was the same thing. She allowed spirits to come in and use her body. So they were wise with the knowledge of all of these things. But here we find wise men, not so wise, but smart enough to seek the Savior. These are, these are the things that we are now sure of. First of all, we are sure that these wise men were not Jews. They were Gentiles. We, we're sure that they came from afar off. These Gentiles did not belong to the commonwealth of Israel. Listen to this. The Jews did not regard Christ, but the Gentiles sought him out. Christ said many times, I came to my own and they received me not. We understand also that they were scholars. This right here, last point just blew my mind. They traveled over 750 miles to get from Saudi Arabia, Persia, or Medea just to get to Bethlehem. That on foot and horseback. Now, the way I drive, I ain't going to say nothing that's going to incriminate me, but the way I have driven in the past because there's some police officers in the room. In the past, long time ago, I have gotten, let's just say I've gotten from Atlanta to New Orleans in five and a half, six hours. That's not a five and a half, six hour drive. But, uh, you know, it can be done. But that's due to modern convention. You have to understand that they were Arabian more than likely. They were on horseback. So they were moving at 30, 35 miles an hour at the most. And the horses are going to get tired, so they're going to have to walk. What caused them to inquire about a newborn king? I had to ask this question because it leads me understanding this. They were, they were smart. They were educated when it came to medicine, religion, astronomy, astrology, divination, and magic. But they were smart enough to know that they did not know it all. So they questioned. And here, is, here it is. Now there's an ancient tradition that says that Balaam, the notorious prophet from Mesopotamia, was an early member or founding member of the Magi. Balaam came, you remember Balaam, the one that the donkey spoke to? Balaam was the one who 1,400 years before, God used him to prophesy about Christ. So the Gentile Magi knew about the coming Savior because God spoke to them through their founder. I just made that make a little sense. There's more to it than that, but I just want to clarify. And now I've verified. It was Balaam's prophecy that told about this future star. Numbers chapter 24, verse 17 through 19 says this. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. Jacob, also known as ooh, Israel. Come on, church. <laughs> and a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheath. And Edom shall be a possession. 
Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall he come and shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. It was Balaam. God used uh, 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 an individual who did not want to be used but could not afford not to be used by God. And this explains to me why these wise men, the Bible says, or we, we, we say often, I won't say the Bible says, we say wise men still seek him. Wise men still seek him. This story highlights the birth of our Lord and our Savior, our King, Jesus the Christ. But I want you to understand, it lets us know that church folk ain't the only one who get to know him. Just because you're sitting in the pew don't guarantee you a spot. Just because you, you come in and you do the traditional things that church has done does not guarantee you a spot. We served the homeless yesterday, but there have been 300 days before that that we walked past them. And Jesus said, if you've done it to the least of these, then you've done it to me. I don't want to miss God because I serve him publicly when people are watching during a time where people feel like giving. But then I ignore Christ 300 other days out of the year and act like a hellion, but then declare myself saved. Wise men still seek him. I would venture to say that as ruffian as they appeared yesterday, I would venture to say that they know Christ. I would venture to say that they, they know who he is and they respect him more than the people who declare they respect him. I, although I can't, I can't ever say that anybody in this room or in this, in this state or in this area is perfect, but I, I do understand that I knew more about Jesus before I got all of this stuff and when I got it, I prayed for it. I begged him for it. I pleaded for it. Lord, if you just let me have X, Y, and Z, I promise you what I'll do for you. If you give me and bless me with this car that I can ill afford, I will pick up people every Sunday and bring them to the house of the Lord. And as soon as God opens the door and your credit becomes good enough or you swindle somebody in the co-signing and you get what you pray to God for, you treat folk like they got a disease and you won't let them get in your car. You won't let them eat in your car. You won't let them do nothing in your car and you don't bring them nowhere. I'm just chopping woods, let the chips fall where they may. Because I've, I've seen when we had nothing, when we were with, without, it kept us on our knees. And I came to you today not to preach this old common, he was born in a manger. But I came to you today to talk to us from our Gentile state, to tell you to remember where you came from, to tell you never forget how God saved you, what he transformed your life from being, and what he brought you to. And it is because of that that you owe him everything. I got in my car this week and turned over 299000 and if I didn't want to be late the way I was going, I'd have got out and shouted. Yes, sir. <laughs> Hold my mule. I shout now. <laughs> I ain't got that kind of rhythm no more. But uh, I got to a point. You know, I, I talk to people and I see people, people that I'm around. You know, I sit at Starbucks and I watch people. They come in. I, I remember uh, last year I was sitting there and a guy drove up. I'm not lying. I took a picture of it. I think I posted it. Had a white Bentley. He had a white Bentley. He's standing in front of me. He had on the, what's the jeans with the U on it? 
true religion. He had on a true religion jeans and the, and the shoes and the shirt and his cologne took up the whole half of the Starbucks building and he walked in, pulled out his credit card, slid it through the thing. They said, oh, sir, that card is no good. So he went in and he's sweating about as much as I am as a Pentecostal preacher and he went into another one. And they said, sir, that card is no good. And how is it that we can have all of this stuff and our credit be no good and think we're going to make it to heaven with good credit? Somebody got to talk to me because we got to change some of the things that we're doing. We got to change our mentality. I'd rather have nothing on earth and have everything in heaven than to have everything on earth and never make it to heaven. So let the church preach you prosperity if you want it. Go after it if you want it. Be rich if you want it. I know half of y'all mad your number didn't fall this week. It's okay. I drove past. I was like, 648 Jesus. I'm like, Lord Jesus, I think, I think my car turning Jesus. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to make it Jesus. Why? Because the lure and temptation of this world is always among us. But we, if you understand this, then you understand why Christ came. We, ladies and gentlemen, have been called out to be separated. That means if I never mix in, I got to be okay with it. If I never make your list, guess what? I'm on another list. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And I came to let you know today that it's because my Savior came. He didn't make it into the rich Carlton. He didn't make it into his grandma's house. He made it into a lowly manger. And today we are feasting off of him. And if you feast off of him, he guarantees you eternal life. So I'm challenged today. I'm honored today that my Savior died. But more than highlighting just the baby, I just want to talk about the wisdom of those who desire to seek him. The wisdom of those who, when they leave the church sanctuary, will go and open the word and say, Lord, show me you. Reveal yourself to me. Walk with me. Talk with me. I ain't perfect, and I hate the way I live some days. But show me how you want me to live. Walk with me in the way you want me to live. Transform my life. God seeks such who will worship him. And I'm just looking for a few folk who will lift their hands and open up their mouths and say, Lord, I'll serve you. Lord, I'll worship you. Not just because of the holidays. Not just because of the time of year. But teach me your ways. Walk with me, Lord. Stay with me every day of my life. And I promise to give you all that I have. I promise that if you walk with me, I'll walk with you. I won't quit even when I want to. I won't give up even when my soul gets tired. Even the youth shall faint. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on easily wing, wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, how to wait. Father, I bless you. Lord, I thank you. I give you praise. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the revelation of your word. Thank you for teaching us things we never know or we never pay attention to. And opening our eyes to let us know that you've always been in the midst of us, in the midst of our lives, in the midst of our conversations, in the midst of our challenges. It's always been you. Now teach us to stand on you, to stand in you until you rise up in us. It is you we honor. It is you we praise. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.